Hello, and welcome to our weekly Bible class at Calvary Bible Fellowship Church, Coopersburg, Pennsylvania. If this happens to be the first time that you've uh, tuned in or logged on, a special welcome. I'm Dick Regal. I'm not one of our pastors here, but I am one of our teachers that helps out when they have the need. But it's good to have each of you with us, whether it's the first time or you've been along with us all along the line since we've been taping. Good to have each of you with us. Well, what we have before us this morning is the longest chapter of the eight that comprise the Apostle Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians. These 28 verses address two major doctrines of our Christian faith. The return of Christ to earth, what we might call readiness, in verses 1 through 11, with emphasis on the day of the Lord, and the role of the church, what we can call relationships. In verses 12 through 28, a series of directives for followers of Jesus in the church. So that's what we'll look at as we look at this final chapter of 1 Thessalonians this morning. Let's do so and begin in prayer as we do. Lord, as we look at this last chapter, this final chapter of this letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, the instructions we read in these verses are as vital to us today as they were to those Thessalonians many centuries ago. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Psalm 119 states. So enlighten us to your truths for the church today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've observed, as we've observed throughout our study of 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul concludes each section, which are our chapters. They were not the Bible was not written in chapters and verses that came along hundreds of years later so that we could easily locate passages and truths that we wanted to look up. But Paul concludes, concludes each section, which are our chapters, with references to the return of Christ. Chapter 1, verse 10, verse 18 of chapter 2, verse 13 of chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 of chapter 4. This final chapter of First Thessalonians is no different. Chapter 4 concluded with Paul's description of Christ coming for his church, what we call the rapture or the catching away of the church in verses 13 to 14 of chapter 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep or who have died, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Note, if you will, if you have your Bibles or your devices open to 1 Thessalonians, that the basis of our hope, as Paul states in chapter 4, is the resurrection of Christ. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as Jesus told his disciples the eve of his crucifixion, because I live, you too shall live, John 14, verse 19, that's the basis of of our hope. And our hope is not something that we tend to use the word hope for today. I hope this will happen. I don't hope, or I hope this doesn't happen, or let's hope for the best kind of thing. No, it's a basis of hope that its assurance is found in God's word. That's the basis of our hope that Jesus died and rose again. Now, as we get into chapter five, we see Paul transitioning from the subject of the rapture of the church, Christ coming for his church, followers of Jesus, to the judgment of unbelievers, what's called the day of the Lord. So let's look at these first 11 verses. We'll read them so we have them before us and then look at them more closely. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, and sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. 
For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. These first 11 verses of chapter 5 are an extended teaching from chapter 4, and some combine them with chapter 4, verses 13 of chapter 4 through verse 11 of chapter 5, but they are speaking to somewhat different aspects, all of which, however, is in the framework of prophecy. Upcoming events in God's plan for the ages, what some have called the unfolding drama of redemption, as God's plans continue to unfold, unfold and work out every day. Now we find in chap, found in chapter 4 that we grieve, but with hope, Paul said to those believers. Loved ones, you've lost loved ones, you grieve for them, but not without hope. We suffer, but with endurance. Now in chapter 5, we see that we're to serve, serve with love, and obey with perseverance. So Paul goes from grieving but with hope, and suffering with endurance, to serving with love, and obeying with perseverance. You see, the Word of God opens the heart of God to reveal the will of God. The Word of God opens the heart of God, that's how we know God, and through that, his will is revealed. The word of God opens the heart of God to reveal the will of God. Likewise, the authority of the word through assurance by the word brings comfort from the word. The authority of the word through assurance by the word brings comfort from the word. That's what Paul was trying to convey to these Thessalonian believers. As Paul ends chapter 4 in that manner, verse 13, he does so in this section, the first 11 verses of chapter 5. So he continues on with the overall framework of prophecy, but in a little different emphasis, as we'll see in this fifth chapter. One of the intended purposes of the Bible throughout Scripture is to infuse us with hope. Romans 15, verses 4 and 13 penned by the Apostle Paul, probably five or six years after this letter to the Thessalonians, he writes, whatever was written in the former days, and he was referring primarily to the Old Testament, was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And then verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So in Romans 15 and verse 13, he uses the word hope three times. So that was Paul's recurring theme, whether it was to the Romans or to the Thessalonians here, that they hold out rather than fold out, or hold up rather than fold up. A lot of people are nearing that today, <laughs> folding up in the midst of everything. But Paul's encouragement to them as well as to us through the scriptures is to hold up. Why? because Christ is coming. Why? Because he rose from the dead. So as Paul sought to encourage and comfort in chapter 4, now he seeks to warn and to exhort. He warns of impending judgment on an unbelieving world, first part, and then he exhorts the believing world, followers of Jesus, to live godly lives, holy lives, pure lives, in the light of his coming judgment. So in chapter 4, he encouraged and he comforted. Now in chapter 5, he warns and he exhorts. Warns of impending judgment, but exhorts followers of Jesus to live godly and pure lives. And he does this, Paul does this, by a series of contrasts between believers and unbelievers, those who follow Jesus and those who don't. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. Once again, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The first contrast is between knowledge and ignorance. Knowledge and ignorance. Times and seasons in verse 1 of chapter 5 in the English Standard Version, or in the New Living Translation, it reads, when all this will happen. 
or in the New International Version, it says God's plan for the ages. However you want to read that, whatever translation you want to read it in, what Paul is saying in regard to what God is doing in our world today, there's no need to write to you about that. We don't have to read any, write anything more to you because we've already done so. And besides, we don't know when it will happen. So Paul says, regarding the times and seasons, we don't have to have anything more written to you. God's plan is, is coming about. It's being fulfilled. It's taking place. You don't need to know anything further than that right now. You're fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That term, day of the Lord, is referred to 23 times in Scripture. 19 in the Old Testament, just four in the New Testament. And it always has to do with the judgment of God on the nations, including Israel. It never has to do with the return of Christ for his church, what we call the rapture of the church. And notice, too, that Paul says it will come as a thief in the night. The judgment of God at the end of the seven years of tribulation described in Revelation 6 through 19. How do we know it's seven years? You go back to Daniel chapter 9. But the judgment of God that comes after those years, Revelation 19, that's what the thief in the night refers to. It does not refer to Christ coming for his church. So those two terms, day of the Lord and thief in the night, do not re re refer to the coming of Christ for his church. They refer to the judgment of God on the nations and on, on believers. So it's important to distinguish what those two terms refer to. Otherwise, it gets quite confusing if you look through Scripture and see those various terms. The Thessalonians knew that the day of the Lord from Paul's teaching had to do with judgment. Apparently, he had opportunity to teach them that. But Paul says unbelievers are uninformed. So there is knowledge and there is ignorance, and they're uninformed to their parents. Verse 3, he contrasts expectancy and surprise. As we've read, while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. On them. There's expectancy, there's surprise. Believers will expect it because they know it from the scriptures. Unbelievers will be caught by surprise. We learn also in Daniel chapter 9 in the Old Testament that a false peace will envelop the world in the time prior to God's final judgment. There will be an appearance of peace, but it will only be that, only an appearance. Just over the horizon will be God's judgment. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. There's another reference to those two terms in the New Testament. The Apostle Peter wrote a decade or so after Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but he was emphasizing the same thing. Judgment was coming. The day of the Lord was coming, and it will come like a thief in the night. Now, in verses 1 and 2, and then verse 3, notice the change of pronouns from we to you in verses 1 and 2. Now, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Other translations say, we do not need to write anything further to you. But there's a change of pronouns from we to you in verses 1 and 2, and to they and them in verse 3. A contrast again between followers of Jesus and those who do not follow. Is that an inference that believers will not be on the scene? They'll already be in the presence of the Lord, perhaps raptured prior or in the middle of the tribulation, in the midst of all this judgment? Because remember, the day of the Lord refers to that period of judgment, Revelation 6 through 19. Could this be a reference, or an inference rather, that the church is no longer here, that is already in the presence of the Lord, snatched away prior to the beginning of all that, what we call pre-tribulation rapture, or in the middle of it, mid-tribulation rapture? Well, perhaps it is, but perhaps it's not either. Maybe reading too much into this passage how you want to interpret the scriptures. It's not whether it's going to occur, but when it's going to occur. There's a contrast in going on in verse 
3 through verse 5, Sudden destruction, destruction will come upon them, unbelievers, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they, they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Verse 5. For you all children of the light, children of the day, we are not of the night or of darkness. There's a contrast between a thief and a baby, and a contrast between light and dark. You are the followers of Jesus in these verses, 3 through 5. Thessalonians were enlightened. Them are the non-believers who are unexpected. For them, the day of the Lord is a thief. To believers, it's like a new birth to be welcomed. So there's the contrast there of the thief and the baby, light and dark. Verses 6 through 8 is another contrast. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Here's the contrast between sobriety and drunkenness. Those who are sleepy, or those who are drunk, are unobservant intoxicated by the stimulants of the world and its offerings. So the, the term of drunkenness may go beyond what we normally think of that term, to being intoxicated by the world and intoxicated by what the world offers. There's that contrast, Paul writes, or are you alert and sober, watchful, diligent in Christian living? There's no room for complacency in what Paul writes here. We're either intoxicated by the world or we are watchful and diligent in our Christ-centered living. One of the seven Beatitudes, and there are seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Normally we think of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, but there are Beatitudes throughout all of Scripture. And in Revelation there are seven of them. One of them is found in chapter 16 and verse 15, I am coming like a thief. There's another reference to the thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments off. And Paul uses the, the analogy of being prepared, of being ready. Ready to go out in the world and dress like you're going out in the world, not unready to go. He uses that analogy of the, the coming of the Lord. And we are prepared, he says, by arming ourselves with faith, that is with trust, by love, that is depth, and hope, hope comes up again, that of confidence. Discipline and self-control should be our approach to life at all times. Faith in what Christ has done, verse 10, which we'll get to in a moment, love from what he does, verse 9, and hope for what he will do. That's our confidence. Faith in what Christ has done, who died for us, verse 10. From what he does, he's not destined us for wrath. Hope for what he'll do. We might live with him. So armed with the conviction of faith, with selfless love, with assurance of deliverance from God's wrath. Thus, we're to be mentally active, spiritually alert, and prophetically aware. All of that's within these verses of 6 through 8, that Paul contrasts sobriety and drunkenness, that we are prepared for what's coming, that we arm ourselves with faith, with love, with hope, that we live disciplined and controlled lives because we have faith in what Christ has done, love from what he does, and hope for what he will do. And so armed with a conviction of faith, the selfless love, and assurance of deliverance from God's wrath, Thus, we are to be mentally active. Now, that gets more difficult the older you get. I can attest to that. But mentally active, spiritually alert, and prophetically aware. There's a reference back in the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32, that lists the 12 tribes of Israel. And they are preparing for David to take over the kingdom of Israel. 
And in 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32, there is a reference to the men of Issachar. And it states that they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. That's to be us. We're to be spiritually alert, mentally active, prophetically aware, so we can understand the times that we're going through, not be baffled by them, and know what we should do and what the church should do as well. So Paul says we need to be prepared. We need to be alert. We need to be people who are sober, spiritually, that is. Again, mentally active, spiritually alert, prophetically aware. And then he has another contrast in verses 9 through 11, the last of them. Verses 9 through 11, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So whether we are awake or asleep, that is, whether we're living or whether we have died, we might live with him. That's a reference back to chapter 4 that we looked at last time. Verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. The contrast here is salvation and judgment. He has contrasted us in knowledge and ignorance, expectancy and surprise, thief and a baby, light and dark, sobriety and drunkenness, now in 9 through 11, salvation and judgment. Paul's counsel through these first 11 verses is to be prepared, verses 1 to 3. To be alert, verses 4 through 8. And then in the verse, these verses, 9 through 11, to be encouraged. So be prepared, be alert, be encouraged. Know what's happening around us. Know the, the times that we're living in. And know what we should be doing. Salvation and deliverance from wrath will be the believer's lot. God has not ordained us, Paul says, or destined us for wrath. Rather, judgment will be the lot of the one who rejects Christ. This last contrasting picture is one of, one of a source of joy for the Christian. Paul alludes to that in verses 9 and 10. We're, again, intended for salvation, not judgment. The conclusion of the discussion of the day of the Lord, this judgment, ends as it did Paul's discussion on the treatment of the day of Christ in chapter 4, that is when Christ comes for his church. He said, therefore, verse 18 of chapter 4, encourage each other with these words, what Paul had written. Verse 11, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So these first 11 verses of chapter 5, the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians 5, discusses the day of the Lord that time when God is coming in judgment. We may be here at that time. We may not be here at that time. But either way, we need to be prepared for it and alert to it and know what God is doing in our world. God's plan is unfolding as he's designed it. God has not been caught unaware by this virus crisis. And God's up there, as I like to say, wringing his hands. What am I going to do now? This thing has thwarted my plans. No, it's not. God's plans are unfolding day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, as he's designed them to be. This is all part of God's plan, as he is sovereign in our world. Well, the final segment of chapter 5, then, which includes verses 12 through 15, addresses relationships within the, re within the church. As we saw, the first 11 verses have to do with the return of Christ, readiness, these Verses of 12 to 15 address relationships within the church. And Paul gives us nine directives. He gives nine directives to the Thessalonians that carry over to us, that we can take and apply to us as much as it applied to them. He says, respect and esteem leadership. That is the leadership within the church. Respect them and esteem them, because they are the Lord's appointed over us. Now, we may not always agree with them, but we must respect them and esteem them. Be at peace with yourselves, he writes. Admonish, encourage, help. And the church is doing that today, helping many people. Our deacons here at Calvary Church are reaching out 
to our families within the church and probably beyond that to help. And many people within the church are helping neighbors and others during this virus crisis. We're to help, we're to be patient with each other. That certainly is appropriate today, to be patient with one another because we're all in this together. Don't retaliate, but endeavor to do good to all. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, which may be the earliest of his letters, written prior to Thessalonians, he writes in verses 9 and 10, do good to all, especially of the household of faith. So here are directives that Paul gives to the church at Thessalonica, as well as to us. Verse 12, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. That is, they challenge you. They challenge us through preaching and teaching. To esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone for evil, anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. There are nine directives, if you want to count them out, as to what Paul admonishes the church to be about today. Worthy admonitions to us today in the midst of this crisis, when people's nerves are frayed just a bit. But remember, Thessalonians is a behavioral manual for uncertain and unprecedented times. And so that's why Paul's words are so timely to us today, because it's a manual for times like we're living in right now. Verses 16 to 22, then, the next phase of Paul's letter, and this could be broken down in several segments, verses 16 to 22, provide some foundational principles for solid spiritual living, what we might call priorities for biblical Christ-centered living. They're like seven Proverbs. In fact, someone has called them Paul's Proverbs because they're not unlike the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. Now, if you go back and count through all of these or read some other sources, you may find numbers differ from the nine directions or the seven Proverbs because people combine them or others separate them. And so the number is not important. What's important is what they teach us. Paul's Proverbs. The first, verse 16, is rejoice always. Don't allow circumstances to deflate the joy of living for Christ. That is, don't deflate what's happening today or in any day to deflate your joy in living for Christ. That's what Paul spoke about in Philippians 1 and verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ. What he means is that life means Christ. Life means opportunities for Christ. God's giving us those opportunities. Life means opportunities to live for Christ, to share Christ. Pray without ceasing, verse 17. Persistent, persevering, prevailing prayer. That means we should live lives that are permeated by prayer, that our lives are characterized by prayer. Are we known as men and women of prayer? Thirdly, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. An attitude of gratitude should permeate us, an attitude of gratitude. This present crisis, I like to call it, that we're going through right now in the spring of 2020, should shock the complacency out of us. It should enable us to be grateful for what God has given us. And it provides the opportunity for us to look at our own lives, for us to look at our homes and our families. Are we emphasizing what we need to be emphasizing? Are we doing the things that we should be doing? Are we spending our time and our resources on the things that we should be? And it's a opportunity for the church to look at herself as well. Are there things we're doing that we don't really need to be doing? Are there things we're not doing that we should be doing? It provides the church an opportunity to look at ministries, to look at budgets. Are we spending our finances or God's finances? Are we good stewardship of what God has given us? Are there things that 
we're spending it on we don't need to be, are there other needs that we need to focus on? And one of those, I think at least, that the church is going to need to focus on financially in the months and years ahead is technology, because that's where the church is going today. Whether old people like us like it or not, like some of us at least, uh, that's where it's going to be. And that's where it's going to be in the days ahead. So we're grateful for what God has given us and also use it as opportunities to look at our lives and our ministries and the opportunities that God has given us as well. So Paul says that we're to rejoice, we're to pray, we're to give thanks. We're not to quench or stifle the spirit. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. That means don't stifle what God's doing what God's work is about. Don't stifle it. Instead, verse 18 of Ephesians 5, be controlled by the Spirit. Verse 16 of Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit. We're not to stifle what God is seeking to do in his people and among his church. Don't stifle prophecies or don't despise prophecies, Paul writes in verse 20. That is, don't despise the word. Don't despise the word. This means uphold the word of God, reading it, studying it, hearing it, obeying the word. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, Paul, writing to Timothy, said, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. No matter what's going on, preach the word. Don't settle for anything less than solid, consistent, biblical preaching. Also in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 13, Paul wrote to Timothy, Give yourself to the public reading of Scripture. The public reading of Scripture. Do you know you can go into churches today and never hear a word of Scripture? One of the things that drew us to Calvary Church here in Coopersburg a number of years ago when we retired is that first Sunday we came was standing and reading the Scripture together. That's rare today, even in evangelical churches, unfortunately. So is the solid, consistent, biblical preaching. Praise the Lord, we have a pastor who preaches expositionally. That is through books, passages, such as he recently did through the Gospel of Mark. There is no substitute for that. That's what the church is to be about. Paul says, don't despise the word. Prophecies, he means by that, not necessarily prophetical teachings, but he means the teaching of the word. Make certain that that is central in what the church is doing. And then he says also, do not despise prophecies, verse 21, but test everything, hold fast what is good. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things, what Paul was teaching, were so. When Paul left Thessalonica because of persecution, he went on to the, the city of Berea, and he, he taught in the synagogue there. And Acts 17 and verse 10 tells us that the, the people in Thessalonica were more noble than those, or in Berea rather, were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they ex examined the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was teaching were so. We're to test everything in the light of God's Word. Why? Because the Spirit of God will never lead us contrary to the Word of God. The Spirit of God will never lead us contrary to the Word of God. I well remember a number of years ago in a church I was pastoring, a lady came up to me following the service and she said, the Spirit has told me to divorce my husband and marry another man. And I said, hmm, well, lady, you got the wrong spirit. And she didn't take that well. She stomped out, and we never saw her again. But the Spirit of God will never lead us contrary to the Word of God or inconsistent with the Son of God. And then the last of Paul's Proverbs, verse 22, abstain from every form of evil or every appearance of evil. If something appears to be wrong, appears to be evil, abstain so there are seven, if you count them that way, seven proverbs of Paul of what we should be doing 
and what the church ought to be doing. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks, don't quench or stifle the spirit, don't despise the teaching of God's word, test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Just a, a staccato, if you will, of, of Proverbs of what should characterize us and the church today. John Stott, who pastored All Souls Church in London for many years, calls verses 12 through 28, which is the last final section of, of 1 Thessalonians 5, he calls it how to be a gospel church. How to be a gospel church. And it's comprised particularly <clears throat> of verse 17, prayer, verse 18, praise, verses 19 through 21, proclamation, verses 20 through to 24, purity, and verses 25 to 28, pronouncement. The church is to be comprised of prayer, of praise, of proclamation, of purity, and pronouncement. And that should characterize our worship. And Paul spells it out here. And though at first glance it does not appear to be, but these verses, particularly 17 to 28, are a picture of the church at worship addressing the corporate life of the church. There's to be prayer, to be praise, proclamation, that's a teaching of God's word, purity, the encouragement of godly living, and pronouncement, what we are to do as we go from the times when we are gathered. Now we're gathered right now, not literally, of course, but we're gathered in front of our laptops or phones or TVs, whatever they may be, but the same applies. That's to be the nature of the church. You know, worship is the greatest priority of the church. As Pastor Dave regularly reminds us, and he's right, it's the greatest priority of the church. Our BFC churches state that the priorities of the church are worship, uh, teaching the saints, and evangelizing the lost. Now, I may not have that in the, in the uh, exact wording, but to worship, to teach believers, edify the saints, I think is what it says, and to evangelize the lost. Those are the priorities of the church. As we said before, up, in, and out. Worship is up, in is teaching, discipling, and out is taking the gospel to other people, helping them to follow Jesus. In his book, Be Ready, on First and Second Thessalonians, Pastor and Bible teacher, conference speaker, Warren Wiersbe pens, worship is the most important activity of a local church. Ministry must flow out of worship, otherwise it becomes busy activity without power and without heart. That's important to note. And it comes out of these verses too, of what worship is. That it's the most important thing that the church does. It's to be the priority. And that's the focus of Calvary Church. That's the focus of BFC churches. And if you're listening from another church, I hope it's the priority of your church. It's the most important activity of a local church. I read in the last week or two where some have been thinking through, you know, what the church is going to look like after this uh, corona crisis is over, when the church gathers back. And one suggested, well, if the, if the church really is to disciple and to teach people, that ought to be the focus. Worship should come after that. No, worship should come first. Worship should come first because ministry flows out of worship. Otherwise, as Wiersbe says, it's just busy activity without power and without heart. And I know our leadership here in the church at Calvary is focusing on, when we come back together, our first, our first focus is going to be worship. And the other things will fall in place as, as uh, time carries on. But worship is acknowledging God's greatness, his goodness, his glory, his grace, and his grandeur. That's what worship is, just acknowledging that God is great, he is good, he's to be glorified, he's graceful, and he is grander. Greatness, goodness, glory, grace, and grandeur. That's worship. It was William Temple who was the Archbishop of Canterbury during World War II in England, who gave probably the best definite worship that you can find. And I didn't have room on the, the lesson notes that uh, you can access by, by uh, logging on to the site right below the, this presentation. 
he said that worship is quickening of the conscience by his holiness. And I'll repeat these. Nourishment of the mind with his truth. Purifying of the imagination by his beauty. Opening of the heart to his love. And surrendering of the will to his purpose. You can't get much better definition of worship than that. Quickening of the conscience by his holiness. Nourishment, nourishment of the mind with his truth. Purifying of the imagination by his beauty. Opening of the heart to his love. The surrender of his will to his purpose. Now, if you'd like to jot that down and you didn't get it, you can either go back and re-listen to this or just Google on William Temple and his quotes and it will come up. Definition of worship. And all of that fits in with what Paul is challenging these Thessalonian believers as he wraps up his first letter to them. And as he concludes his first letter, he does so with a reference again to the return of Christ. Verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Paul has addressed that issue of sanctification and holiness. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely and then the last verses are short verses. Verse 25, brothers, pray for us. Paul asked for prayer, as we should pray for our leadership, and especially our church leadership as they wrestle with, you know, how the church is going to come back, when it's going to come back, what it's going to look like, all of those things, without all of the other things that, that church leadership has to deal with today. Now we're focused with how we're going to deal with all of this. So even more so. Paul asked, brethren, prayer for us. Verse 26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, that was the way these first century believers greeted each other, with a holy kiss. Now, we shake hands, we embrace each other. Well, we did, up until about a month or six weeks ago. Can you imagine coming into the fellowship of the church and not shaking hands or not embracing one another? I can't envision that in the church. And I don't know what it's going to look like or what we're going to do, but somehow we have to have a means to greet one another. And so we'll have to figure that out somehow. But Paul says, greet all the brothers in, in, in some way at least. I put you under oath, verse 27, before the Lord, to have this letter read to all the brothers. He strongly encourages everyone to listen to what he has written bring the believers together and have the letter read to them. They don't, didn't have it in print like we do, all the copies of Scripture. They had to listen to it. And so Paul encourages that strongly. And then the last verse, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, there's a lot here in this fifth chapter. Practical, day-to-day -day application of teaching regarding the return of Christ and the role of the church. Second coming of Christ is not a theory to be discussed, but it's a truth to be lived. And we have that before us, just how to do that even today. Let's pray. Lord, the practical, the personal, the persistent purposes for our lives today, you have spelled out to us through the pen of the Apostle Paul in these verses, in these chapters, in this letter of 1 Thessalonians. Help us by your spirit now to live them out. We pray in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Next time, we'll venture into Paul's second letter, the Thessalonians, chapter 1. There are just 12 verses. And as you read through that, I encourage you to do so. You'd think Paul was writing this week. We'll look at the progress of persecution. He, called, he discusses persecution again in and we'll, we'll look at how persecution has progressed in our time, the last quarter century in this country. What would the Thessalonians say to us today? What would the Thessalonians have to say to us today? We know what Paul says in the scriptures, but the Thessalonians were to come among us. What would they say to us? And then how does Thessalonians relate to all that's happening today beyond what we've already looked? All of that we'll look at next time, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Again, thanks for joining us. See you then.